Uh, uh, as you know, this is our regular recitation session uh, when we have usually relatively small groups coming together to discuss the, uh, basically to discuss the topic that we addressed in our lecture earlier in the week. Um, and we're just doing it in a little different style this week because, um, well, for a number of reasons. One is that we have some, some special guests uh, here. Um, never had so many nutrition related or sensitive people in the, in the same room uh, for some time uh, here at uh, SEPA. But uh, I think the main, one of the key reasons we're here is this idea that the, the global food system is actually failing us quite badly at this time. Um, and you've heard the statistics from me, from Jessica and others that we have about one billion people going hungry. We have two billion people with micronutrient deficiencies. More than a, a, more than a billion overweight and obese. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and we've made all kinds of progress, nevertheless, in <laughs> terms of the science of production, the green revolution. Uh, globalization has offered all kinds of, uh, I would say, uh, unprecedented opportunities to trade and to move food around the world. Uh, we were just talking last night about the way is it beans and carrots find their way to, from Kenya to supermarkets in the UK. Uh, New York, you can find coffee from any part of the world. Um, and also ICTs basically have created, I think, unprecedented opportunities to share knowledge and information. So there's almost no excuse in terms of information uh, on, on how to solve the problems that we have. But somehow we're still doing an incredibly lousy job of uh, feeding the planet. So the idea of this morning's panel really is to try to, through interacting with you and our panel of uh, experts here, to understand what's going on and also understand what can be done in practical terms. And uh, for anybody who's not immediately part of uh, this course, this is a part of the Global Food Systems course at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a 14-week course uh, that I teach here, um, and this week we've been focusing uh, more on nutrition. So earlier in the week, uh, Jessica Fanzo gave a lecture on, on nutrition. Um, Jessica, as, as you know, is a, a senior scientist at, at Bioversity International, where she heads up the nutrition program. Um, she previously worked as the nutrition coordinator for the Millennium Villages Project. And, and was really instrumental in ensuring that nutrition became part of the portfolio of uh, investments that are undertaken uh, in our uh, Millennium Villages project. Um, she is a hardcore, I think card-carrying <laughs> nutrition scientist. Um, <laughs> from Mars, no, <laughs> uh, from, from Rome. And um, she migrated towards agriculture and biodiversity, I guess, in the last five years or so. But she can deny that. She has a chance. <laughs> but she also wrote a very key report. She was the lead author of a very key report to the UN last year on progress towards MDG1. So um, second is Roslyn, who is a, a associate research scientist at the Earth Institute, Roslyn Raymonds. Uh, she's basically taken quite a different uh, journey. She started off in agriculture, in biotechnology, but I'm not sure you m that means GMOs, does it? No, but it's it kind of you. molecular <laughs> biology, hardcore plant science. Uh, but she's gravitated towards nutrition as well, but, but basically through biodiversity as part of the ecosystem services of agricultural systems. Um, you know that earlier in the course that she gave one of the lectures where she, uh, where Roslyn talked about uh, case studies in the Millennium Villages project and the role of biodiversity in improving nutrition. And finally, we have CJ Jones, who, CJ, uh, some of you have met her before, but she came the furthest distance. She came from Kenya, um, has a background in business entrepreneurship. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience living in Africa. Uh, she's been a farmer. You can tell us about that in Zimbabwe <laughs> at one point. She is Australian, though. Uh, she's a company owner. She was a company owner and director, and most recently has been a business enterprise advisor. 
Um, she's now applying all that interesting background and experience as the country director in Kenya for GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And this afternoon, she's going to be giving our practitioner seminar at 4 o'clock, where she'll be talking about GAIN and, uh, and, and her experience uh, there. And on Tuesday, in the Global Food Systems course, she'll be talking about value chains. So the basic format for this uh, session here is that, as you know, I um, asked many of you, at least those who were in the class on Tuesday, to send me questions, uh, anything that, that you'd really like our panel to address, sometimes things that we, we didn't have time to discuss uh, in the, the lecture itself. Um, and uh, well, I have to say, you responded really very well to that, um, you know, right up until 1.30 this morning. <laughs> um, but some of them did come in a lot earlier. So we managed to give all of those questions uh, to the panel here. And we'll try to cover them today, but if we forget or, or, or miss any of these, uh, we will have a, an interactive session and you make sure you, you raise them again. And those of you who were sort of saving that great question to deliver it live, um, well, it, you, you'll have your chance as well. Um, oh, I should introduce myself just for the camera. Uh, Glenn Denning uh, as uh, the uh, professor here uh, teaching the Global Food Systems course at Columbia. So just to get started, I, I don't know if you've been I suspect you've been reading the newspapers intense, intently over the last few days, but you would have seen yesterday FAO released its new, uh, its latest monthly statistics where they showed that the global food index has once again risen 2.2% in the last month. So that's the February data is, is up 2.2% over January. Now the food index I think is a basket of about 50 commodities, but narrowing that down to the cereal index that actually rose 3.7%. So cereal prices, rice, wheat, maize, etc., have, have gone up almost 4% in the last month. And they are now approaching the level they were at the peak in 2008. Whereas the overall basket of food, uh, the global food index, has already well past that peak during the last uh, food crisis. Um, so the question, the first question we're going to pose our uh, panel here is how does that affect different players, different, different actors, if you like, within the global food system? And I wanted to start uh, with Jessica and, you know, focus initially on the people probably who really matter most, and they're the consumers. So how, how are these high prices affecting consumers right now? Well, I think in the last food price crisis in 2000 and, and 2007 and 2008, uh, obviously the, the, the poorest of the, of the population are the most impacted because they traditionally spend most of their income on food to begin with. Um, and they often cannot even afford their own diets. And we talked a little bit about that in, in class, but the cost of the diet often does not meet up with their income. So with the food price crisis, there's a pattern that um, the poorer populations tend to substitute more expensive and nutritious foods for the less expensive, less nutritious foods, and that's predominantly staple crops, which obviously has huge implications on nutrition and diet diversity. And those that are most affected by this, of course, is pregnant and lactating mothers and children, young children, particularly children under two years. And I have to say, though, that the, the last food price crisis, unfortunately, uh, could have been a very huge lesson. And, and a lot of reports did come out of that. But what didn't happen in time was that it's still very unclear the, the nutritional impact of that last food price crisis. And it has not allowed for the nutrition community to be very uh, proactive with this food price crisis. There's not a lot of real-time data, uh, vulnerability data that can be quickly collected. So unfortunately, it's a little bit unclear from a nutritional side what the real impact was from the last one. And we weren't prepared for this one. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, th there's a big push right now to provide nutritional food safety nets for these food price crises and establish these permanently 
in countries that are more vulnerable to this and with, with larger proportion of people who are undernourished and, and, and in poverty. And they're really promoting two big programs. One is uh, micronutrient supplements and conditional cash transfers that are linked to mobile technology so people can, can uh, get cash right on their mobile phones and be able to purchase foods, either as food vouchers or as cash, as food stamps. And that's a big push right now to do that in some countries, but again, it's getting a little bit too late to implement these sort of large-scale uh, programs. So. so how do you, I mean, one of the questions uh, somebody raised is, how do you target those uh, safety net programs? How do you know that the people who really are struggling at the, at, at the very bottom there, how do, they, how, do they, how do we make sure they end up with the food they yeah. get well, supported? I think um, you know, World Food Program has set up something called VOM, which is a vulnerability assessment and monitoring tool, and they're really trying to do this across the poorest nations um, and so they can find these hot spots of vulnerability on a real-time basis. Mm -hmm. And WFP is important because they are really moving more towards these conditional cash transfers and moving away from in-kind food assistance, or mm. at least trying to balance that more. And so these sorts of large vulnerability mappings will become critically mm. important. That's at like the national scale, is national it? National scale, yeah. yeah. But I think that, you know, there's, yeah, I mean, I think there's still huge pockets of neglect right. where, where really vulnerable populations are completely uh, neglected. CJ, do you have something on that? I was yeah. just going to change the tone of the conversation a little. We're always talking about problems, but so he, I can uh, just uh, reflect on a potential solution or an attempt to create a solution to this problem on conditional cash transfers using mobile technology. I personally think that whoever invented a system that they're using in East Africa called M-Pesa should actually get the Nobel Prize because it's had the most significant impact on people's lives, you know, across all sectors, all comers. Almost every single person in Kenya has a mobile phone. And they transfer money between themselves. They transfer money across time. You know, it's just the most amazing mm -hmm. thing. Now, World Food Program are trialing uh, using M-Pesa, a conditional cash transfer that is linked to nutritious foods. So you can only buy particular things at particular retailers mm -hmm. with your cash that comes on your phone. So we take it, it, there's huge security issues, of course, in some parts of Kenya. So this now has been eliminated with this cash. World Food Program has actually now um, outsourced, in a way, the really significant problems of distribution of food. They don't have to take those huge lumbering trucks of theirs into hard places. They leave it to the traders who are very good at it anyhow. I don't know if any of you have ever been in Africa. You want a cold Coke? You can find one in the most amazing places. Di never ever think that an African, the Afri African systems are not anything other than remarkably efficient in many ways. Distribution channels do exist. And it's, it's, to me, it's very heartening that organizations like World Food Program are starting to recognize traditional distribution systems and using those, we call them in Swahili, dukas, to distribute better foods to people in vulnerable communities through the cash transfer. I know Jess is going to say, yeah, but. That, <laughs> Jess and I have been friends a long time, and I know there's always a yeah, but question from her, <laughs> or a what if question. We can go from Garissa to Nairobi with what if questions. That's how many she's always got for me. <laughs> So, but what if? The what if on this one is nobody's thought to engage the private sector to produce enough nutritious foods for the low end of the market mm -hmm. so they can be distributed to these people on the cash transfer programs. Mm -hmm. Later on, I'll rant at you again about one of the failures of this system is that we don't engage the private sector. Mm -hmm. We think they're bad. We think they're nasty people who rip poor folks off. And we'll talk a little bit later about why I think that's actually not Always the okay. truth. So we'll park the private sector for a minute yeah. and move on actually to the biggest private sector and they're the small scale farmers. Yeah. And I wanted to ask Ro, you know, with, with these high food prices, <laughs> is this good or bad for small scale farmers? And, you know, what sort of impact is it having on them? 
Yeah, yeah, and that is a really interesting question because you can see both positive and negative trends for these smallholder mm -hmm. farmers. Because if you see the food prices increase, it also means that if you are a farmer that produces some surplus, you get more money actually for, um, for your products. But this also really depends partly on where the money concentrates. And that will come back to the discussion we can have with CJ on kind of where do you actually get the gains of your money um, from, from these increases in, in food prices. And, um, and it also depends, of course, of the increases of inputs that are also increasing um, very drastically now. And there, the private sector also has a big role to play, and as well as the public sector, on how these prices are, are managed and to, to be able to um, transfer the benefit from these higher food prices um, to, to, the, to the farmers on the ground. And another positive uh, trend that you can see is that there has been really a wake-up call um, in, uh, for agriculture that they're in, in the world, that um, investments have to be um, redirected to agriculture, agricultural research, a extension, um, all different parts from agriculture and, and food systems. Um, and, and this also with, f f for, for nutrition also, this goes also along with some of the, some of the key lessons learned from the past with more emphasis on, on gender that, are, that is now in every proposal. I don't know if it will actually <laughs> mean something, but it's already much more there in the discussion mm -hmm. than it used to be. And, and these in increases in income can also really uh, mean something further on uh, towards nutrition if you look at um, how countries change and how um, relationships between income and nutrition, of course not everything, and there I can also feel the it's <laughs> <laughs> coming, but it definitely if you Always look the at... <laughs> the Always the pessimist. Always the scientist, yes. <laughs> there are definitely um, positive things of increasing income for, um, for improved nutrition. And the third positive thing is also that um, the whole kind of debate on biofuel production has really um, been kind of shaken up a little bit and the focus for agriculture is now much more on food where the smallholders have really a, a big role to play. Mm -hmm. But there are also definitely some, some negative trends for, for these smallholders. The first most obvious one, if you are not a surplus producer, you actually um, have to buy your extra maize on, on, on on or your extra cereals on the market and, and that is then more expensive and also that will make it even more challenging that if you want to increase actually your production the input prices are going up mm -hmm. um, so um, so for these really vulnerable farmers it's even more uh, challenging and then the other negative trend that you can see is also that the focus is again very much on quantity and on staples and, and um, cereals and, and this makes the whole um, um, goal to inject more nutritional goals in agriculture some even more challenging because um, people um, are really focusing again on in increasing the yields of uh, cereals and, and things like that. Um, but, but at the same time there is also really an, um, um, an opportunity actually to, um, to sh to show and to, um, to advocate that um, quantity and quality can really go together. And, um, and, so they are, and, and there you can see many um, potential synergies. For example, if you think about, and then I, I'm thinking personally about diversification, um, and it raises the question about diversification versus specification. But uh, um, diversification seems um, to, to put it kind of very general can definitely create some um, benefits like it, uh, more resilience so that you are not just dependent on on one crop um, and and also to provide more different nutrients as we discussed in class and and also more cultural richness and and diversification of products also further along the value chain. So there's a, this question of vulnerability, right? And, and I think that's what a lot of people are concerned about now. Yes, the prices are going up, but if you see the trends, I mean, they, they crashed downwards after the last spike. 
and now they're back up again and we're kind of waiting it's a real it seems to be if you look at the trend over the last 25 years it was really steady for a long time mm. and then jump then down jump back up again so the whole issue of volatility and stability you know how do we stabilize things in a way where farmers can make rational decisions and I you know I'd kind of like to just move on we'll come back to this uh, biodiversity uh, issue a little bit later but does the private sector then is that is that kind of part of their role to to improve uh, stability or reduce volatility because they're actually being blamed a lot for the volatility uh, people are saying uh, you know at the worst level they're speculators but at the best they're shrewd investors because they're jumping in when they see the potential for increased prices so uh, CJ, can you talk a little bit about what all this means for the business sector? And I assume there's going to be positives and negatives there too. Okay. I just also wanted to follow one, one very important thing we can't forget here. Africa is actually urbanizing at, a, at a, an incredible rate. And the truth is, smallholder farmers cannot feed large urban populations. So increasing African urbanization is going to mean, like it or not, we have to have industrial food processes. That means large farms. So what you're talking about here is a structural shift that's going to be necessary to feed large urban populations as they continue to grow in Africa. The very worst nutrition data uh, indicators for Kenya are coming out of our already huge urban slums. Our, our, in Kenya, in these our, stunt, our general sort of generic stunting figure is about 32 to 36. But in Kibera, it's 47% of the population is considered stunted. So, I mean, never, you must always keep in your mind as you deal with this conundrum that large urban populations, poor populations, must be fed by other food, and a food system which is not based on doing it yourself. It's not smallholder agriculture that's going to feed that population. So it is going to be, become an increasingly critical problem for Africa as we urbanise. Can I disagree? You can. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, I well, I don't, <laughs> I, you know, I actually, I don't see why if we improve productivity of small scale farming uh, to generate surpluses, why smallholder farming cannot meet the needs no. of urban populations because it, it, as, it has as done that in Asia. Um, I think we're saying the same thing though, Glenn. I think what I said, what, what I was trying to say is we're going to have to change the way we do it. So what we're really going to, we might not have to change the way we, the smallholders farm, but we certainly have to change collection and distribution and payment back. We're going to have to have innovative okay. finance systems to pay people back. Right. We're going to have to have ways of ensuring that they're um, insulated against rapid price rise if they put things into warehouses. So we're still going to have to have a paradigm shift in the way yep. we think about a smallholder producer. Right. So, so subsistence farmers yep. cannot produce enough for urban areas. No. But if we improve productivity, of, you'll yep. agree that if, if yes. we can yes, assess, you know, develop systems involving <laughs> the private sector, we can mm, generate yes. surpluses yes. from smallholders. Yeah. I, I, maybe I'll give you an example of how private sector can really impact some of this stuff. One of the problems that large milling companies have is, vo is actually getting enough product. They, you know, they, they, they have trouble collecting enough maize, they can't do it, they can't get around, da, 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 da. And so instead of, so we have been, Gain has been looking at the issue of small scale fortification at, at hammer mills and posher mills. And it, the truth is it's almost impossible. It's not impossible, but we have the technology to do it. There's a micro doser, you can attach it, you can do all these things, but it's almost impossible to ensure quality. It's really hard to make sure that the, micro, that the fortificant gets out there and that it's not been mixed with sand or milk powder or salt or whatever. It's really hard to make sure the guy's micro doser is working the whole time. It's really hard to make sure that the maize that's being chucked, tipped into the posho is not so badly affected with aflatoxin everybody's going to die anyhow. So the quality control levels at smallholder producers in those posho mills is really hard and it sort of is the reason people shy away from small scale fortification. I can see somebody just having a heart attack over here. It's a huge conundrum. I think that's the Ethiopia team working on fortification. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get back. Well, your, long your, conversation your second Kendra about that. Set of questions will come later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about it. So, um, 
how does the private sector work? Let's think about it. We never solved the problem of the artificial heart while ever we made it look like a heart. The minute we made it look like a pump, it starts to work. So let's not think about trying to solve the problem by fortifying at small mill level. Why don't we change the distribution system? Why don't we get the large-scale millers to pick up the maize and in return deliver fortified flowers? Swap basis. Okay? It's going to have to be a price thing happen and it will be more complicated than I'm saying now. But we could do it. Change the model. Instead of getting them to fortify at micro level, fortify at large scale level, collect the maize, keep it in a better system so that it doesn't get aflatoxin infected, but make sure even small rural areas have fortified product. I don't know. It's a solution. A solution re led by private sector. It's practical. Is it's it being done anywhere? Where is it being done? Well, it could be done in Ethiopia, perhaps. What about South Africa, you know, countries that it have large tried. scale? It no. hasn't been tried yet because it's a very lateral thought because we keep trying to attack the problem like the artificial heart. You know, everybody wants it to look like a heart, so they feel nice about it. Okay. We just feel nice about having, them, having people create their own food. But mm -hmm. Perhaps it won't work. Okay. So we've had a few sort of uh, ideas there reflecting on consumers, uh, farmers and the business sector and how they're reacting to and how they're responding really uh, or even anticipating uh, the higher food prices. Uh, are there, while we're on this topic, are there any other questions uh, or comments from the floor uh, really about this issue before we move on to dive a little bit deeper into some of the issues? Yeah. Okay. Mine's more about the cash transfers, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, I've been reading a lot of studies recently. Speak up. You just so right. they can um, pick it up. The cash transfers, um, as a policy innovation in Latin America, have been very successful. But in terms of Africa, they've been less successful, particularly with health and nutrition concerns. And that um, a lot of studies are showing that reducing the fees for nutritional food or reducing on-site access to clinics or things like this are actually better policy. And um, so I was wondering. Uh, if you've noticed, you said the cash transfers, um, I, I think in Kenya, on the mobile phones were working better, but are, are you noticing that that's not true, or is there, is there some discrepancy in the research, or what's going on, I guess? <laughs> so who'd like to pick up cash transfers? In terms yeah. of the, the Kenyan m mm -hmm. story, it's brand new, so it's really hard to know whether it's going to work or not at the moment. The real gap in Kenya and for East Africa, because we are a trading block, East African trading block, is that we really don't have enough nutritious foods that are, that are reaching these very sort of smaller dukas and outlying kind of shops. This is the, this is the big block at the moment. So um, as a system, it should work if we can get the private sector to start producing enough um, nutritious foods at the right prices. And, and We'll talk about that sort of issue a little later, but I mean, just yeah, the Malawi. There's a cash. I think it's a conditional cash yeah. transfer um, program in Malawi in one district. It's been quite successful mm -hmm. in reducing undernutrition, um, and Malawi is looking at that program to scale up nationally. Mm. Uh, but Malawi is having issues with their budget. <laughs> <laughs> this was a this was but, a, a um, great little project which it, it, UNICEF and it was evaluated, the impact yeah. was evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's it's a, it's an interesting case that people are looking at, but there needs to be more of these mm. types of conditional cash transfer programs that are directly health or nutrition related. Mm. Um, you know, the one that we talked about in class, the South Africa one is quite different. That's more of a pension, a, a retirement pension mm. almost. So Somebody okay. actually asked, uh, how, how do we target uh, in those programs? And that particular case in Chinji, mm -hmm. in, in, in Malawi, uh, th they basically asked the community yeah. to come up with mm -hmm. who, who was, they had enough, they had a certain amount of money, and it wasn't very much, but they said, look, uh, we mm -hmm. reckon we can afford to provide cash transfers to 10% of the population. So that became the cap, and it was up to the community to come forward with the names of, of people. And it was done on a pretty participatory mm. basis. Mm. I, I can't say you know there wasn't a bit of abuse here or there, but it, it was an exciting looking program. And mm. we saw people lined up, you know, putting their thumbprints and, and, and basically uh, 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 grandmothers looking after orf, you know, orphans and, and uh, really, really low income people were coming forward and getting a small amount of cash uh, because Malawi had implemented a really successful fertilizer subsidy program, but 
there was a whole bunch of people who had no land and had no use for fertilizer. But uh, this program seemed to be helping them, you know, buy some chickens, uh, buy a school uniform so their kid can go to school. Just, just really basic things that change the quality of life. And it actually has shown up that it improved their nutrition as well. It's been pretty intensively evaluated. And Malawi is quite interesting, though, because they have the large a agriculture subsidy program. They have this cash transfer program that people are looking at very carefully. But then they also have a national acute malnutrition treatment program that's scaled completely yeah. in every district throughout Malawi. So it'll be interesting to see how these different programs have impacted nutrition yeah. over the long term. Mm -hmm. And okay. another interesting case is also the Oportunidades in Mexico, no? Mm -hmm. Where they also do conditional tra cash transfers. But, and they, they have seen reductions also in, in undernutrition, but now they are, also, they are raising the question, how can we now also use this to maybe address some of the big obesity questions that are coming up in, uh, in Mexico? So we're going to come back to obesity in the second round. But. I had a question. You were talking about uh, modernization of agriculture, which tends to be at odds with the diversification that Ro was talking about. And I know that there are nutritional reasons for diversifying, which maybe people you know, aren't going to grow their own food and that sort of thing, but there's also environmental reasons for diversifying. So is there any opportunity for overlap or cooperation? Yeah. 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 And to, to also add to that, I think it really depends also mm -hmm. at what scale you want to look at diversification. And mm -hmm. you can, if, if, we, if we start, for example, at the global level, it's very obvious that we have to diversify more and produce more nutritious crops compared to um, all the carbohydrates that we are producing. Um, but then you can ask, no, the, que the main question in agriculture is now, where can we intensify and increase uh, grain production? But I think an additional question should be, where can we um, produce the other nutrients and where, where can we um, diversify and where are places where we can produce this, this and this? So I think it depends on what scale you look at. You don't have to always diversify within one farm, but you can diversify in a village or in a food shed. And that's where um, the link with the business, I think, can really be generated if you look at these different scales of di diversification to, to address this volatility in prices that you see at a global level. And also, I think that one of the, one of the interesting things that um, we need to sort of build into this picture is, is behavior change communication. If we don't have demand drivers, if people don't want to buy nutritious food, it won't be produced. It's simple. Let's face it. Business is about making some money. We all like, you know, that's fairly fundamental. So we have to be able to create demand drivers to get business to shift as well. So we could put pressure on businesses and call them nasty, evil things because they're not producing the right food. But if they all go broke, we're all dead in the water anyhow. So we have to change people's behaviour patterns so that they start to demand better foods then private sector is going to step up to the market and start to try to figure out how to produce them. And again, a small example, we, we are working with, again is working with the, some of the major milling companies in Kenya right now on a national fortification program. And one particular milling company that I have a lot to do with is incredibly worried about erosion of its market share from a woman-led business in who, what she's doing is milling diverse traditional products into maize mills. So she's got maize and millet, maize and sorghum, maize and amaranth, maize and cassava, and she's got a lovely little packet, no Winnie's health product, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. Complete. And this, here's a huge milling company, 51% owned by Seaboard, which is the largest, one of the largest Canadian millers in the world, worried about the erosion of its market share from Winnie's. Now this, this is because people are buying that product. It's complicated, it has to do with recognition of their traditional foods, it has to do with aspiration, but it's a demand driver. And I've been talking to my colleagues about, let's figure out how to drive the demand to get biodiversity meaning something, you know? I'm gonna get the smallholders to grow me amaranth because if I mix it with my maize sara, I'm gonna cut that mark, I'm gonna have that market segment. So, you know, it's that holistic approach to these problems. Isn't one of these the great success stories, leafy vegetables, yeah. African leafy vegetables in Kenya, like it started from almost extinction mm -hmm. through to mm -hmm. finding it in supermarkets. Does some, one of yeah. you know that story? How did, how did it, I mean, that's clearly a yeah. case where demand 
has put this stuff on the shelf, right? Yeah, uh, Bioversity International and uh, AVRDC and others were promoting uh, in Kenya traditional leafy greens, and there's over 200 varieties of them in Kenya. And they were sort of neglected and underutilized, and people abandoned them. They were often associated with, with poverty. Mm. And um, a, a Bioversity and others went in and, and started working with women farmers at, at uh, reviving these leafy greens. And um, they created a local market, and then, then this spread uh, pretty quickly. And these women now sell their leafy greens to large supermarkets in Nairobi, uh, like Nakumat and some of these uh, large uh, chains. And you know, when you're in Nairobi and you're living there and you shop at Nakumat, they're a very hot thing for middle and, and high income classes throughout Nairobi. Mm. They've, they've been uh, revived, like quinoa or some of the other things that are happening in the United States a bit. Mm -hmm. but, but this is this is directly impacting something that traditionally Kenyans had abandoned, but right. it came back. Well, so. What about in the villages? Would they be still consuming them in yeah. sort of yeah, they're consuming low income them. areas? And it's it's created, you know, great income wealth for these women and mm. they consume them themselves and it's been really incredible. And there's just a, a paper that an impact paper that came out ten years following the pro after the project had ended, and that's really the important thing is to look at impact much further down to see and what's happened and it's really had a huge impact really sustainable so it's it's an incredible example of taking a noose a neglected underutilized species and, and making it very mainstream okay. so. so advocacy is something worth investing in mm -hmm. uh, in this way and people can change behavior you know but people so. can change behavior um, I was just curious because with vegetables fruits and vegetables you need a heavier investment in terms of supply chain and cold storage to keep it fresh because the shelf life is really short. So I'm just curious if somebody came, stepped in for it to happen in terms of Kenya. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if there was some sort of uh, intermediary technology, but... Yeah. Um, because that's always the most yeah. challenging thing with food so yeah. My guess is that Nakamat do. Yeah, they must. They get the pro this is and this is a guess, okay? But looking thinking at the quality of the product that's on those shelves, and this yeah. is a high end supermarket. So what they're what they're trading off here for their demand drivers are the um, the fact that most sort of urban Africans, no matter how wealthy they are now, really like to say they're still doing things their grandma did. You know, like, oh look, we're still mm -hmm. eating these traditional greens. So looking mm -hmm. just really purely from an observational point of view, there's got to be somebody put a cold chain into it because it's yeah. getting mm -hmm. into those supermarkets, mm. not a wilted mess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's been, they're either backing it into a bigger product. Mm -hmm. um, in Kenya, it's a, it's, you've got to remember that Kenya is one of the biggest suppliers now of vegetables to Europe. So we have very, very extensive cold chains there. You know? so, they maybe are just building it into an existing cold chain, picking it up, moving it through. I don't know. But it's definitely, you're right, they have put it in a cold chain. And so now the second phase is what they're doing is they're promoting it to be included into hospital meals. Mm. Because usually hospital food mm. in most of sub-Saharan Africa is very, very <laughs> poor and uh, or not, not very balanced and or doesn't exist. Usually families have to bring in their, their yeah. own food in tertiary mm -hmm. hospitals. And also in schools and school meals. So that's sort of the second phase now is they're trying to push some of these more traditional uh, nutritious crops into, into these, these major um, other institutions like schools and hospitals and things like that. So. Okay. Yeah. Up the back there. Yeah. Sorry, I missed the question. Yeah. Uh, first, what, what role do you see for small-scale farmers in the future who are transitioning to a more large-scale system? I, I would agree with Glenn. He's going to die of shock because I said that. Huh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, just such years he's been trying to make me say things the same as him. Um, I, I think there's still a very big role for small-scale farmers. I just think the way we work with them, perhaps the paradigm for that might have to shift a little bit. And the way we collect and store product must shift. You know, 
Um, Glenn wanted me to talk a little bit later on, but we might not get to it and say no because it's a bit boring. The thing about warehouse receipting. But you know, we might just, I, I very much think that we shouldn't, we will never shift away from small scale farming and we shouldn't in Africa. We just need a different interface point. So we need to rethink that. So um, I see a, I don't, I mean, I see a profound and, and continuing role. So there's a much more sophisticated uh, uh, processing and marketing systems mm. around small scale farming than currently exists. So I think that's the key message moving from subsistence to commercialization. But sometimes as if it was a large farm means you have to have collective storage, sometimes collective processing, collective fortification. These kinds of things need to be done at scale. Finance. Uh, and, and, and finance and, and, and the like. Is it on this, this topic specifically? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, we can move on. Can no, well, did, did anyone on, else want to comment on, on, on um, Vino's point? Yeah, I also, well, on, on the storage and processing thing, I, I think it's definitely important for this more nutritious crop, like you were also saying with vegetables and fruits, that's maybe one of the reasons also why it's so much more difficult to get these in all of the markets and and so I wanted to re-emphasize that particularly for, mm -hmm. for these nutritious crops and, and more diversified. And there was, I was just going to say one other thing. There, there are also cases now of one of the critical problems is the cutting up of land in Africa, most, in most developing world countries, you know, because of the inheritance systems. Smaller and smaller plots, more and more kids get. But there are some really interesting community-based things now where land is being aggregated. So instead of them all going one little bit, one little bit, one little bit, one little bit, there, some communities are getting together and saying, ah, this is stupid. We're just going to have almost like a community farm stuff here. And they're actually ag putting their land together and farming it is as if it was one larger farm. And they're making, it, okay, this is a pure observation again. I, it seems like they, make, they get better returns when they do that. So communities themselves are coming up with some really exciting ways to solve this problem of you know, cutting up land in terms of traditional inheritance. Mm. But I do look back on Asia and I see that despite all, you know, all the scientific and economic uh, developments that have taken place in Asia, people are still, they haven't really aggregated uh, hugely. They, they still operate on small scale farms. Um, I mean literally Japan still operates on small scale farms. Uh, people haven't moved to these huge industrial uh, farm models that, you know, that, we, that we see in the West. So that's why I sort of still maintain that it's possible to continue small scale farming. Uh, you know, it's not essential to go to this larger industrial farming. Although you know, we'll, we'll address it later in the course, we'll talk about this issue of um, what's sometimes referred to as land grabbing or let's say investment in large scale farming uh, in Africa and in some other parts of the world. We, we probably won't address that in any detail today, but it's, it's a process going on. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, when you talk about creating, uh, demand drivers, uh, <laughs> um, so creating de demand drivers for more nutritional food, is that going to come at a, a higher cost for the consumer? Because when you look at demand drivers that are created in North America, you think of organic foods, and it's more expensive, and there's an expense associated with it. Um, do you think that'll be a concern? So we'll, you're saying we'll, uh, because there'll be demand for these leafy vegetables, they'll become so expensive. Or is it just going to be associated with an additional cost? Because I think over here, when you think of healthy and nutritional food, you associate it with it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. And that's why it kind of appears towards a certain class. Good question. Um, I want to say, I hope not. It is, I mean, this example of this woman who's eroding this market, she, those products are quite high end. I think though one of the roles that GAIN has, we are really very interested in the lower income groups. So when we work in terms of fortification, one of the, um, we don't actually give grants directly to fortifiers, but, but what we do do is put a lot of money into the behavior change communication and advocacy to try and shift, to drive the really demand from the consumer end, like they want it so more is produced. So we, we certainly are hoping that it doesn't increase price and would rather hope the contrary, that it will help drive price down from volume. But uh, again, this is an exact, I guess it's a good example of shifting where you put your money in development. We're not giving it to the 
most lo logical people, which is the fortifier, we're actually trying to change people's behaviour and drive demand that way. This time it's Sarah. Good question. Uh, this was with regard to like small scale farming versus large scale farming. Um, as you mentioned, in Asia, it's still, well, maybe in East Asia, it's still a lot of small scale farming. But I know in Pakistan and India, feudal systems played a massive role. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, one could argue that that's why they had a, you know, the Green Revolution happen and so forth, because they already had so many aggregated farms. But there's a massive issue of bonded labor and the fact that people can't seem to get out of poverty in the first place because they already have cap, like they're not going to be allowed to buy the people mm. who are kind of running those farms. So I'm wondering how we would deal with that. I mean, that issue would be a massive, it's not really going to help. Revolution. <laughs> Land reform. I mean, that's what's happened in, I mean, that, that is a problem in Pakistan mm -hmm. and uh, parts of India, I guess, mm -hmm. that uh, people are not you know, have not benefited hugely, at least proportionally, for the advances in the Green Revolution. Um, on balance, however, you know, the, the research has actually shown that they have benefited simply because most of these labourers, if you like, uh, landless labourers, are net consumers and the increased productivity has actually, in real terms, brought the price of food down. So they've been indirect beneficiaries, but they haven't necessarily benefited from the, the productivity increases to the same extent that the, the, the owner has. But um, that's in, in the end, that becomes a, a political uh, issue in some parts of the world. Uh, land reform has moved at a, at a fast rate. Uh, I think Taiwan is the best example that exists. And, and that was a case of where the um, the rule, the current government in Taiwan moved in and implemented land reform, just like that. Uh, the Philippines, uh, we've been struggling with land reform there for the last uh, 30 years or so, um, and we still have a lot of large-scale farmers and very poor tenant farmers uh, in, in, in that country. So it's, a lot of it's about political will and, uh, and having systems in place so that there is reasonable, sort of equitable benefits from these uh, productivity improvements. Alison. Um, we've been talking a lot about driving up demand and that's how you're going to eventually supply it, but even, even if that happens, there's still a lot of impediments to the supply side of it. And yep. I was just wondering if we could talk a little bit more about what some of those might be, especially if you're talking about subsistence farmers who aren't even producing for the market just for their own nutritional outcomes. and maybe a little bit more of the research with diversification in the villages or if you're doing that side of it. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think it also goes together with it. A lot of the research and a lot of kind of the improvements have been on the major staples and that there is still a lot of improvement um, and potential to kind of for research on many of the other things of the other crops and livestock also and also about more integrated um, systems and um, so there are definitely still ma many challenges on the on the supply side and you can often when you um, see in the village also um, the, t the tomatoes it's <laughs> often they just look very bad or other kind of vegetables and and fruits it's it's much more they are often much more vulnerable um, to grow um, and one particular issue there is also that they require a lot of, of water and that is um, on the supply side the water issue for um, is a very challenging one so I think there it's also where there's a lot of potential for better water management um, to be able to grow these more nutritious um, crops. Um, in discussing again the issues of demand and supply for nutritious foods and the definition of what it means to supply nutritious foods, um, people tend to, the issue of income, without a rise in income, it's unlikely that people will, through just behavior change, demand but more fruits and vegetables if those continue to be more expensive. And there was a recent article in the Economist that touted the success of the private sector, like craft foods, in promoting you know, high energy biscuits and products like Tang as nutritious as a, a supplemented for nutrition um, in, poor, in poor countries. And so I wanted to see your opinion on how the private sector can be driven to 
provide more nutritious food in the form of fruits and vegetables. And tell the truth. To just fortify processed foods. Great question. Uh, for me, it raises a number of sort of structural and even moral issues. You know, how do we get private sector to be truthful? The great case, of course, is, is Nestle and its relationship to the code of marketing breast milk substitutes. So I think that there, you know, it's a big problem, um, and you know, one of the things that we need to do is is try to figure out some mechanisms to keep uh, business honest in terms of its claims for products. But we, there are lessons to be learned really from its distribution and its market penetration. So somehow people like you who are sitting here, masters of development practice, you're going to be dealing with these issues in a, in a hopefully a much more holistic way than, than we did, than I, than I have ever been sort of really brought, you know, schooled to do, that you'll be starting to challenge private sector to be more honest and, and realistic about the claims they make. There, of course, there are very strict, there are rules. The Codex Alimentarius, for instance, puts pretty strict guidelines, but it doesn't always have very strict rules about claims and labelling. Organisations like GAIN, with advocacy, we do work with our own business alliance to try and ensure that all claims made on food that's being produced by our alliance members is real. Um, I know that doesn't answer your question entirely, but I, I think we have to come at this problem from, from very many different angles, and we have to work with companies who are ethical and who will produce nutritious food and put the correct claims on them. But I, and then learn from their clever distribution channels, like Coca-Cola, it's amazing to me. You can get a cold Coke anywhere. Can you get a Diet Coke everywhere? <laughs> no, you can't, no. that's the point. You can get a real Coke, like you can get a full on you know, sugar, sugar. sugar yeah. blast Coke, but you've got to wonder, you know, why, are people, why are people wanting that? That's the other thing, like how do they do that? And there are many lessons for us to learn from how they did that. Mm -hmm. how do, why do they like Tang? And you know, how do we manage to convince mums that a can of milk was better than breast milk? How do they do that? And how can we use that to our advantage? OK, I'd like to use this to move on to a, a another topic and and that is uh, something well she's going to do in a minute no and and it came up it came up last week and we we rushed through it a little bit but I, I judging by some of the questions you had we need a little bit more in-depth including me um, understanding of this idea of the double burden the double burden of malnutrition <laughs> and I'm looking at Jessica because she really understands that double burden and uh, has explained it to me several times but I still haven't quite Got that right. Would you explain in very simple terms what is this double burden that nutritionists talk about? So, um, as, as we had discussed in class, as some of you were in, um, the double burden is, is, is when you have a population who's overweight and underweight, whether it's in the same country, globally we're experiencing a double burden, but in the same country, in the same community and sometimes in the same household. Um, but you know, the, you're seeing this shift um, of, of people who are becoming more and more overweight and obese, and it's called the nutrition transition, and it, it really mirrors the epidemiological transition of the demographic transition of countries. As countries get wealthier, they get heavier. And there's really two main drivers of that. There's the global shift in diets, so people start eating a very energy dense, uh, high fat, high sugar, low in micronutrients, much like the American diet. Um, and there's a decrease in physical activity. Uh, the sedentary nature of work, uh, the mode of transportation, more and more people are getting off their bikes and getting into cars in places uh, like Nairobi, for example, where CJ lives. And then urbanization. And we're seeing more and more of this overweight and obesity in developing countries, transitioning countries, and you see a lot in South Africa, Brazil, India, China. Um, and, and you really do see it more with urbanization. It's a trend, it follows the trend exactly. But you do see it in rural communities, much less than you do in urban populations, which I think was a little bit of the uh, question. Um, but it still exists in rural communities. It's, it's, there's, 
There's no denying that that exists, but it's just in much less numbers. And the scary thing, though, for, for with the double burden is that there's, there's two things that are, are, are quite difficult. One is just how to change it. Uh, there is the behavior change and knowledge and education um, at the village level or the household level or the community level. But it's, it, it's quite hard to change behavior. And it's, and it's really quite difficult to lose weight. I mean, as a lot of you probably have friends who are trying to lose weight. Once you get past a certain set point or threshold, it becomes extremely difficult to lose weight. Um, so you're dealing with a behavior change and a will sometimes, but physically it becomes extremely challenging, particularly with the cues that we have all around us that make it so hard to lose weight. The second is that in, in, in countries where there's a lot of poverty and a lot of undernutrition, Children who are born of low birth weight have a genetic propensity to gain weight in adulthood very rapidly. So I sort of call it the genetic double burden. You're undernourished when you're young, and you have the, the unfortunate ability to put on weight very quickly as an adult. And we're seeing this more and more in developing countries. And in the last 20 years, some of the developing nations have caught up with what, what took 50 years in the United States. So this is real, this is scary, and it's not going away, and the numbers are actually getting higher. And it's going to take massive reforms at a government level, like taxing sodas, taxing fortified tang, which is basically fortifying sugar water. Um, you know, that's not, we're not moving in the right direction, you know. To, to, f and this is where private sector has a huge role to play as well. Um, right now, in you know, New York, they tried to pass a tax on soda. Didn't work, as far as I know. I don't know. When I left New York, it, hadn't, it didn't go through. But this is where private sector needs to come to the table with government, and they need to start solving the problems together. Um, so, Do you see any of that? I mean, you've interacted with people from... PepsiCo and some of these, are they, are they playing lip service to this or are they actually, do you think? No, I think they're concerned. I mean, I think uh -huh. there's a legitimate concern. I think Pepsi has made huge strides in trying to put more nutritious foods on the market. Um, I, think, I think that they can no longer do business the way they do it and they know that and it's recognized and they want to have a thriving business. They want to they make money, but, but the idea now is maybe we can make money off of healthy foods. You know, that's sort mm. of the way they want to move. And I think overall, people have been quite pleased with the small steps that the private sector has been taking. It's obviously not enough, and it's something needs to change dramatically. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, there's a, a great book written by a guy named David Kessler. I don't know if any of you know who he is. He was a former commissioner of the FDA and he's the one who basically took down large tobacco and he wrote a book recently called The End of Overeating and he talks a lot about how psychologically and genetically we we become very addicted to the foods that industry has has put out on the market and it becomes a very very it's like almost like a drug addiction um, and he talks a lot about what the private sector could do to, to really turn this around. But it's an incredible read if you have time, because he's extremely scientific, but he's an advocate as well. Um, so I encourage you all to read it, because it's a very good insight into the psyche of how, how we physically get addicted to sugars and fats, and, and how industry knows that. And they play off that, but they also know they have to change that. There's also, I just, I agree 100% with Jeff, so much everything she said. Two things that I want to say. One, better. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the only reason about it. 51% of Kenyans are overweight. Hi, James. Hi. <laughs> 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 
It's 60% in Australia, yeah, so don't worry. 60% in Australia. We are now the most obese people in the world. 75% in Mexico. We got it. So 51% already, and we've, I've told you, you know, in some areas we have 47% stunting. So, you know, we, this is a really big issue because the public health system has had no investment in it for the last zillion years. But the second thing I just wanted to say about the whole sort of Coke issue, because ba we bashed Coke, mm -hmm. although I do like the distribution. But look at it this way. Here's your choice. A sinkhole of dirty, filthy water that your cattle eat, bottle of Coke. You don't have any other fresh water. You, you haven't got a well. You know, you share your water source with your animals or with the, all of the animals from your area. Sinkhole water, you know, full of E. coli and other... Sell Aquafina. Coca-Cola bottles it. Absolutely. That's what we've got to shift. But it's not, sometimes it's not, you know, no more just because they want the, yeah. the sugar. It's because it's mm -hmm. the only safe thing for them to drink. So there, you know, sometimes you've got to think, oh, mm -hmm. why is this really happening? It might not necessarily just be the sugar fix. It is, could also be, I'm not going to die if I drink the Coke. If I drink that, I could. So, you know, but Jess is right. They could do water. They could just And water. make money mm -hmm. off of it. Yeah. Um, I guess, especially, it's a question for all of you, but as far as obesity rates relates to urbanization, um, there's, there's some studies that I've read about that actually low birth weight doesn't make you just pre predisposed to weight gain in later life, but especially when you change environments because the, the, your, your metabolism adapts to lower nutritional mm -hmm. status basically in utero and then especially when you get this this change in diet post so which is likely to affect the poorest of the poor people who are involved in that urban migration mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you comment? yeah and the environmental cues you know i mean they'd even do it with wealthy populations if they follow uh, Japanese who live in Japan their whole life and then they migrate to the United States and they they follow the trends they if they gain weight when they live in the United States just because of their different environment different foods so yeah that's that's very true um, you know but in particularly in places in Africa it, it's not only a tendency to gain weight but it, it becomes the risk factors associated with that type 2 diabetes, stroke, cardiovascular disease, you know, all of the other things, and, and they, the, the risk factors become higher, and one of the ones that's really perplexing is hypertension. And even in the Millennium Villages, mm -hmm. if, uh, we did uh, some sampling with um, a professor from Harvard named Dr. Walter Willett, who's very interested more in the non-communicable disease side, and, and he found that hypertension amongst, these are rural populations, uh, uh, men, um, normal BMI, you know, not overweight or obese, but their hypertension rates were 30% high. 30% had, had hypertension in Rwanda, Malawi, and Tanzania. 30 to 40%. So it's really perplexing um, these, these types of non-communicable disease risk factors, whether or not associated with being overweight. So. You know, James, you walked in late, so I, I have the right to ask you a question. <laughs> now, up the back yeah. there is James Warriero. James uh, is the, ha was the health coordinator of the Millennium Villages Project in Western Kenya, but uh, will soon be coordinating health across all of the villages in East and Southern Africa. But James, this question about the health system in a country like Kenya, is it actually thinking about these new problems, the, the sort of uh, problems that, that Jessica just talked about, high blood pressure, risks of stroke and all these kinds of things, or are they still back in the, like focusing on malaria and dysentery and these, is, are the systems catching up with these new problems? For the most part, the systems are, are still focused on infectious diseases. Um, you find that uh, the most distal stuff in the, in the smallest health facilities in the, in the communities will have good training to handle infectious diseases and there will be pretty clear algorithms that they can use to reach decisions on how to handle some of these things like the nurses and uh, clinical officers who are the physician assistants. They will have the capacity to handle those sorts of problems. When it comes to non-communicable diseases, there hasn't been 
as fast development of guidelines in provision of treatment. And the other thing is uh, the change also in the essential drugs list. Um, the changes that need to be made to expand the formularies right. at, the, at that level of capital of provision uh, has also been rather slow. So it's only in recent years that you find uh, uh, some of the anti hypertensives for instance, uh, who are called culture child blockers, and uh, another important class uh, of anti hypertensives called uh, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme blockers. These are only now getting into the formularies of okay. that sort of level of uh, healthcare provision. But uh, other things like uh, drugs that lower cholesterol, you will still find those in the formularies of um, secondary and tertiary level uh, of healthcare. And so if you're talking about 30% uh, of people in a rural area having the kind of problems that uh, Dr. Fazo is, is uh, describing, and yet, at that level, uh, there isn't the medication, there isn't the training uh, to handle them. Then, uh, uh, frankly, the healthcare system is not catching up uh, as fast. Well. Yeah. Sorry, I know this is going to be a bit of a prickly question, but um, I guess from what I've seen, there's, you know, Alma Atta was proposed as far as the health systems, and then there was sort of that was impossible. So people have really focused on vertical health systems. And then um, in the Millennium Development Goals, we see these sort of broad, overarching goals. And yet, from what I can see, and I'd be happy to hear your thoughts if somebody disagrees, that very much the health care provision um, has still been very vertically focused on these single streams of initiatives of, malaria and HIV and things like that. And, and I guess as it relates to nutrition, it's very concerning because as the diets and as the nutritional problems change, the, 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 fall, the health fallout we'll see will change and the systems we've created don't necessarily, aren't able to respond to that. Do you want to? Uh... No, I, I, I agree. Traditionally, if there have been vertical systems, I mean, the HIV AIDS as a you know, as as treating a disease has been inc incredible. At not only the advocacy side and mobilizing funds, but what it's often created is this vertical system of treating one disease. Um, you know, and, and, and the funding schemes work that way. The donors want, PEPFAR only wants you to fund HIV. Only recently have they put in nutritional therapy as a piece of PEPFAR. Um, before they weren't allowed to even touch food or, you know, invest any funding in food if you had a PEPFAR grant, for example. Um, but I think in the last few years that's changing. I think people are realizing, and James can talk a little bit about running an entire health system, and he himself was also involved in the agriculture system. I think there's a lot more movement around integrating um, uh, public health interventions, and, and, and nutrition is one of those beautiful things that really trickles across all the sectors. It's very hard to just provide a supplement you know, one micronutrient, like vitamin A, without really thinking more holistically about all the different different things. I mean, you have to think about malaria when you think about nutrition. You have to think about diversification when you think about nutrition. So I think that's changing. I think, you know, vertical sector approaches have been long criticized, but donors need to follow suit with that. And it becomes a little bit complicated to really tease out where funding streams should go and the cost effectiveness of, of, of where your funds have gone if it's, it's spread out across many things. So, but I think it's changing. I think people are really taking more of a multi-sector approach and nutrition is one of the ones where, where you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit like gender. It, it sort of goes across everything, which also is a disadvantage because then people don't know really what to invest in. So that's why we created the Masters in Development Practice, everyone. <laughs> and even have people from the public health school come and participate in some of our programs like this. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned about the impact of 
Well, you mentioned there's more um, price volatility right now. And so I'm just concerned about like any investments in nutrition, what's going to be the impact of there's volatility in the, in the prices? Has anyone studied this? Like, if a family for one year is you know, food secure and then goes mm -hmm. to insecure, how will that affect it? Actual on a, on a house? On it's a just like. I think IFPRI's doing that kind of research, aren't they? They're looking yeah. at it on a household basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we uh, specifically on nutrition, that they've yeah, they've actually specific, measured yeah, those the, changes. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think people are looking more at, um, you know, when they're talking about vulnerability and shocks, people are looking at acute malnutrition episodes. Um, the impact on more long-term chronic issues like stunting becomes a little bit harder to tease out. But one thing they can look at is the number of cases of children being enrolled in acute malnutrition programs and um, things like that. But, you know, even in the last, and we talked about this earlier, in the last food price crisis, um, there was really more of a study of, of household expenditures and how those would shift during a food price crisis. That was really sort of more of the focus and looking at dietary outcomes. So what was the change in the quality of diet? But there wasn't, it becomes more difficult to look at the nutritional outcomes. You know, what, what were the changes in child growth? That becomes more difficult. So you know, there's been a lot of talk recently with this food price crisis to really establish these community-based management for acute malnutrition programs or CMAM programs that they've done in certain countries like Ethiopia, Malawi, Niger, to really be able to beef those up. And if those are beefed up, they can figure out how many children are being enrolled in that and look at the different um, you know, shifts from seasonal, seasonality changes and, and food price crises. So, but it's not really clearly understood even what the last food price crisis, what the impact was. Hmm. So. One of the things uh, you actually mentioned that in your lecture about this uh, use of products like Plumpy Nut, right? And, you know, for uh, acute malnutrition, right? Now, actually, one of you sent a question in, what, can we use that, or is it being used also uh, for sort of long-term chronic malnutrition? Is that a f practical? Uh, Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> There's blogs uh, all over the place on this issue, yeah. of course. But, but let's this give, because we're running out of time, let, can you give us like the one minute, two minute quick I'll, Yeah, answer? and all three of us can give our opinions. This is a huge debate of what's the use of ready to use therapeutic foods, RUTF, Plumpy Nut. Um, you know, there's groups that believe that it should be used, and all of you know what RUTF is, it's the very sweet high nutrient dense paste, right? That helps children who are severely malnourished, acute malnourishment, um, to short bouts of, of, of Keeps them alive. undernutrition. It actually rehabilitates them back to health. Um, and it's very expensive. It has a patent on it. Uh, so it's hard, it's a little bit hard to get. It's very expensive and there's a debate of whether or not it should be used as a preventative tool. So you give these kids different products, um, supplementary uh, foods, um, to, to, so they don't fall into this acute malnutrition um, state. And RUTF, the therapeutic food, is uh, being promoted by, by some organizations as this prevention. Um, Jeff Sachs and I wrote a Huffington Post blog about how we believe that our UTF should only be used for severe acute malnutrition cases. We believe that prevention should be much more addressing the long, the, the root causes of undernutrition using agriculture sector, uh, improving water and sanitation mm -hmm. and things like that. These more sustainable approaches, importing a paste. I, I personally do not think that it will, um, I don't think it's a sustainable approach. So, but there's a big debate on it. And there's actually uh, an online journal called World Nutrition. And about, f there's four top long-standing nutritionists, one being the head of, former head of UNICEF Nutrition, that wrote about the whole debate of RUTF 
from the beginning to the to the current, and it's a great read. Um, but um, so I, I encourage you all to read it if it's something that you're interested yeah. in. But no. I think we might leave it at that. We've got about like no more than five minutes to go. One thing I wanted to do. I'm sorry if anybody else had questions, but uh, as I said, uh, CJ will be speaking this afternoon at four o'clock and then back next week uh, at our regular <laughs> Global Food Systems uh, slot. And uh, Jessica's always available by email. We bring her back every few weeks <laughs> to New York. Uh, you guys but, can come visit me in Rome. And she's welcoming <laughs> you to Rome. But just any last minute thoughts, uh, one or two take home messages out of all this that any of you would like to sort of share before we, before we close up? holistic approaches and don't let's don't hit problems face on you know think about some lateral solutions that are inclusive yeah and I think also um, when you read for example articles now about these high volatile um, food prices look also into what people are saying about um, diversification in agriculture and other things than just improving a uh, yield or stabilizing yield of of staples and and think about what the potential is um, of diversification. What you what you think and how how this actually could happening at what scale on the ground to link with the private sector and with the health systems. And uh, yeah, and I think you know with the diverse array of topics we were talking about, I think my take home message is you know a little bit on CJ's of being holistic, but being more proactive, less reactive. Mm -hmm. um, and this you know, particularly pertains to the food price crisis. And I think that no matter what happens, that in nutrition, the groups that we absolutely need to focus on, which largely were ignored for the last 40 years, is pregnant and lactating mothers, very young children, and women farmers. And, and I think it's pretty clear now what to do, and it's just a matter of implementing some of those. And that's a very specific target group that's been long neglected. Um, and and there's, very, there, there's very good interventions from farming to, to clinical nutrition um, that can be implemented targeting this group. Yeah, so. and just on the proactive part also, it's not, not only a that's not only very important for nutrition, but also for environment, of course. Mm. And, and in class, we will come back with, um, further on it with Sean also and yeah, in Glenn's class. OK, so this is great. I, I think this has been really, really helpful and complementary to the lectures. And maybe we'll, we'll try this style again uh, sometime. Mm. Um, if, if this was uh, Nutrition Idol, I'd get you to vote off one of the panels. Next time. <laughs> but I think they did such a great job. We're going to invite them back again next week. <laughs> but please join me in thanking our panel here.